So as the higher education sector plays an increasingly prominent role both in society but also the economy more generally, as well as receiving uh, increased public subsidy, uh, whether it's through student uh, debt write-off, research income and so on, this question of accountability becomes more important. So whether it's accountability to the general public, and so we've certainly seen increased interest over the last 18 months around a whole range of issues, whether it's from uh, grade inflation, free speech, Vice-Chancellor Pay, zero hours contracts, a whole range of things where accountability to the general public becomes more important. But also accountability to students themselves, as they're contributing more themselves, they have increased expectations, and this question of value for money becomes increasingly more important. I suppose also this, there's also this question of accountability to the regulator. So in England, with the Office for Student, this brings me on to my second point about regulation. The Office for Student has many powers relating to regulation, whether it's revoking degree awarding powers, university title, uh, the ability to go in and enter and search uh, providers. It's interesting when you speak to regulators who have been involved in the regulatory sector for a while, they all say that there is no regulator that has a power that it never uses. So once you, you start off a new regulator, it comes in and sort of says, oh yes, these are only in the most extreme cases we'll use that. Over time, those processes start to become uh, normalized uh, within that. But also this question of regulatory divergence across the UK. As England takes a very different uh, approach to an increasingly competitive uh, regulatory market, uh, it moves increasingly apart from particularly Scotland, but other parts of the UK, so this divergence across the UK. So as I say, within England, the regulation has increasingly moved towards creating and supporting a marketplace, whether it's the removal of student caps, the uh, desire to bring in new providers to shape up the landscape. This is all intensified competition between institutions, and particularly against this background, uh, against this backdrop of uh, the downturn in uh, the number of 18-year-olds and whatever may happen uh, after the 28th, uh, 29th of March next year. And this leads to some interesting behaviours of institutions most recently in the press around unconditional officer offers uh, and the potential impact that that can then have uh, on some of the, uh, our values within the higher education sector and what we perceive as uh, a good uh, approach and uh, good uh, attitudes within higher education. I don't think I have enough time to expand that point, unfortunately. But with competition also uh, brings me to my last point about increased uncertainty. Clearly with any competition there will be winners, but there will also be losers. Uh, and so during the passage of the Higher Education and Research Act, there was a lot of talk about institutional failure and what could we do to uh, protect students within that case. But recognising that institutional failure may happen at some point. If you think about the political reality of even a medium-sized university going bust, the impact that would have on its region, that's very difficult politically, but you then see, what are we now, three, four weeks into term, uh, I think it's now eight heads of institution that are now have retired and that's their retirement in the last three weeks. I don't think it's any, any coincidence that that is uh, not long after NSS results, not long after student, student numbers. Uh, these kind of pressures are going to become increasingly important on institutional managers. So accountability, regulation, competition, uncertainty. Those are the mega trends.